when our child shared their story with us about being sexually assaulted, our world absolutely fell apart. It hit hard in a lot of different ways, um, feeling that we were not equipped um, at all as parents and where did we screw up. And it's hard because you are often asked to trust folks that maybe you don't know and one of the things that probably has been taken away from you is that trust. From our experience with our child, we, we had to, to be able to open up that trust again and, and work closely with the CAC. I can't even begin to imagine going through any piece or part of this without the folks from the CAC at our side. What is a CAC? A Children's Advocacy Center, or CAC, is a child-focused way to handle child sexual abuse cases. In one place, representatives from law enforcement, child protective, prosecution, mental health, medical, and victim advocacy all work together to conduct an interview and make team decisions in a process that's easy and effective as possible for a child and his or her family. I think one thing that we have learned over the years is for a child to have to come into a police department, into an interview room, is not the setting that we really want a child to have to enter. And when you walk into a CAC, you're walking into a home. And so a CAC home is just a, a warm place for a child to be able to come into, feel safe, and feel that whatever's happened to them wasn't their fault. And that there are individuals that are there and ready to best serve them. Because of my confidence in the Children's Advocacy Center, it is the place where all of the interviews for every single child who has made a disclosure of sexual assault takes place. I need all of those interviews in assessing the case and in deciding whether or not criminal charges should be brought. Prior to the Children's Advocacy Center, they would endure several different interviews with multiple different people telling their story over and over and over again, which really ensues additional trauma. Years ago, they'd have to come in, they'd have to talk to the police. A, a police officer in uniform take an initial report. Then they'd probably have to talk to a detective. Then they'd have to talk to somebody at DHS. Then they might have to talk to somebody at Spurwink. They had to keep uh, somebody to DA's office. They had to keep reliving this and, and telling it over and over. Where the CAC, we all kind of come together as one. The kiddo has to tell the story one time. We all get to listen to it once. CACs can be located in a hospital, a converted mill, a courthouse, or a house. But each CAC works towards accreditation by the National Children's Alliance using a proven model and held accountable to national standards. In Maine, all CACs are connected and work together. It all starts with a phone call. When I get my cases as a detective and I receive the basic information that I have from the victim and the family, I then call the family services coordinator at the CAC who is able to then delegate um, the tasks, the different tasks that happen after that. We call the CAC, we um, tell them what we have, who the victim is, give them some of the demographics. A detective calls me and says, look, this just hit my desk. They called me in, I'm a, the on-call detective. You know, what do you want me to do? And I'm like, whatever you do, don't interview that kid. <laughs> you know, we call Cat and say, hey, how soon can we get this kid and family down to the CAC to do, to do an interview? Obviously, there are emergencies that a CAC can't accommodate or occasions when it's better for the child to wait. But the CAC's goal is to accommodate everyone as soon as possible. They contact the CAC, and then the CAC contacts the family, or the caregiver, the non-offending caregiver, in order to um, set up a time to come in. Everybody is notified of the time, and then we all uh, emerge on the CAC to, to rally around um, that child and that family who's making that disclosure.
we get to the Children's Advocacy Center for that initial appointment, there's what we call a pre-meeting, which is a, a great time for the caseworker, the DA's office, the law enforcement officer, and the interviewer to have some information about what this interview could entail. For example, does the child have any developmental needs, any speech needs, anything like that that the interviewer needs to be aware of? Is there a name or like a specific title that they refer to this individual as? We have a pre-meeting where we have the parent or guardian come in and talk with Child Protective Law Enforcement in the District Attorney's Office, and that's their opportunity to ask questions of us and for us to ask questions of them. Um, no, I'll let the child know that there is a video camera in there because we're asking for them to be honest with us, so we're honest with them. Some of the things that caregivers or guardians ask us about are whether or not they can be in the room with a child when the forensic interviewer is talking with them, and it's the same through over 800 CACs across the country um, that we don't allow caregivers or guardians in the room and that's so the child can feel comfortable and confident talking with someone that um, is neutral. When the interview actually takes place, they, the child does go to another room um, without the parent with the forensic interviewer. That interview is recorded and the multidisciplinary team watches that interview. The fact that it's being recorded and that there are people watching it, I think gives the parent a lot of comfort to know that the child's fine. So tell me about yourself. What kinds of things do you like to do for fun? For one, it's one less interview that I have to do. And it's a specialized interview. It's a very delicate interview to do. And when I, as a law enforcement officer, can take that interview to someone that's specially trained, that's a win-win for everybody. It's a win for the child and it's a win for law enforcement. The interviewer will pause at some point and get any additional questions that the observers want asked. The other thing I think I sometimes hear from caseworkers is, you know, what if they don't ask all the questions that I want them to ask? I don't know any caseworker who hasn't done an interview out in the field, come back to, has come back to the office, listened to their voice recorder and gone, oh shoot, I wish I had gone back and asked a follow-up to that question. When at the CAC, they're able to be the person listening live and in the moment and taking those notes and, and saying, that's an important thread that we need to pull a little bit harder on. The word that comes to mind is neutrality. It gives you a chance to step back a little bit and, you know, am I missing anything? Um, are the dates correct? Uh, could that have happened the way he or she said it did? The most interesting piece, and I think the most beneficial piece to all the parties involved as well, is that while the child's being interviewed, there's a family advocate at the Children's Advocacy Center that meets with the family, that meets with the non-abusing caregiver and talks to them about services that are available, such as mental health services in the area, um, as well as medical evaluations that may be necessary um, and what those specifically entail. That advocate puts a lot of fears to rest for the family and really helps support them during that interview process as well. Because it's not just about building cases, it's also about making sure that the child is, is promptly hooked up with services that might be beneficial to the child. There are a lot of things about this process that, that go deeper than just whether or not a case is prosecuted or how a case is prosecuted and uh, that was an eye-opener to me and I think it will be to a lot of uh, new prosecutors too. Mental health, we come in on the, on the tail end of things to make sure that families' needs are being met, that we're setting families on a path to healing. So, you know, from start to end, I kind of like to think of the CAC as sort of like a crossroads between seeking justice for families and setting them on the path to healing. One of the things that we talk you know that we see as forensic interviewers is when the child leaves the room sometimes they're skipping back into the room to their parents or you can just almost physically see a weight lifted off their shoulders as they leave the room and then go back to their parent or caregiver and that's just really an amazing thing to witness. So after the interview there's a debrief and the team is able to sort of share information about what they know based on the interview as well as what they may have known coming into the interview. Everyone can talk about what the next steps are going to be, what additional information needs to be gathered. Yeah, I was thinking about contact to your attorney's office to see what, they, what their take is on that and then we'll go from there. And After the child is interviewed, a caregiver has an opportunity to meet with the MDT members who have watch the interview. They get their questions answered. Thank you for coming back in for the post-meeting. Um, this opportunity for 
the detective in Child Protective to let us know about next steps. I'll let them explain what the next steps are for your child. They're going to hear from law enforcement. They're going to hear from um, the Department of Human Services if they're involved on what the next steps are and what they can be prepared to expect. Um, as they go forward because not knowing is pretty anxiety provoking and while that's happening the child is in with the family services coordinator and possibly making a tile. All of these handprints not only represent all of the great work that the Children's Advocacy Center has done but it also represents a world of survival for these for these children and their families and that they're not alone. And that three months later, six months later, a year later, that there's always a place, there's always a person that they can reach out to. Even after the interview day, services are there for the family. We all go away and, and the supports that can, the family can be referred to will stay afterwards and, and hopefully be with them and help the family to heal after we've done our part in law enforcement. And, hopefully even prosecution. The multidisciplinary team's involvement also continues. They meet for a case review to sharpen skills and procedures for handling future cases. For law enforcement, it was always the, uh, the finish line was prosecution. If I can get a uh, guilty verdict, then we've done our job. But it goes so much beyond that. For a child to have that trauma have happened to them and then having to live with that trauma, and for the family to have to also provide the appropriate needs and services for their children. The CAC does that. They meet those needs every single day for every child. Children's Advocacy Centers offer clear benefits to the child, the family, and the members of the multidisciplinary team. Advantages start with the interview itself. When you have a client that you're sending to the CAC that's a controlled environment that's very different than sometimes when we're out in the field and we're trying to interview a victim of sexual abuse, um, we don't have control over the room that we're sitting in. We don't necessarily have good control over um, our audio recording devices. If you're not specifically trained to interview children, trying to interview a child can be pretty stressful and worrisome. Knowing that the CAC is there is a huge, huge stress relief. So it allows me to actually absorb more information from the child as opposed to um, administering the actual interview. You're trained to ask these open-ended, non-leading questions. That in and of itself is very different from what law enforcement are used to asking. So the two, it's almost like night and day, they're very different. So to have that formalized training to be able to ask these open-ended, non-leading questions is very important. When you deviate from the, the court-approved, tried-and-true methodology of talking to kids, it's no, longer, it's no longer defensible. And what you have is a tainted interview that a defense attorney can walk all over in a trial. Sometimes people are worried, you know, do I have to go to the CAC because they think I can't do the interview as well as the CAC could do the interview? It's not about caseworker skill level, um, but it's about someone who's dedicated to doing that day in and day out. And really coming in and having a team from the get-go um, is, is helpful because those are all the people they're going to have to coordinate with anyway, so it ends up being one-stop shopping for caseworkers um, and a time saver. And so it's not about uh, people being able to do a better job than, than you or a worse job than you, but it's just about being able to be a part of a team right from the beginning. Many of the CAC's benefits come from the fact that there is a multidisciplinary team. We are never a part of the investigation. In fact, we are a neutral party, and I think that's really important for people to understand so that they know that they're the ones doing the investigation. We are a tool. We are a part of that process. We are not instead of. We are doing it collaboratively and with you. One of the great things about Children's Advocacy Centers uh, is that they bring the assistant district attorney uh, in early uh, in the process. One of the reasons that um, it's good to have a prosecutor uh, involved is because a prosecutor might be looking at an interview with a child, 
uh, and be a little more focused on, on dates, locations, uh, elements of potential crimes, the types of questions that that prosecutor would want to ask the child if he or she were on the stand. Those are the questions that are going to come into his or her mind as that interview is going. Uh, so the earlier they're brought in uh, to the process, it means they're a lot less likely uh, when the case is pending to, to have these unanswered questions or to possibly want to uh, coordinate a second interview or third interview. We always uh, really try very hard to avoid doing that. Before we had a child advocacy center, um, usually I would not even find out about an ongoing investigation of sexual assault um, of a minor until the whole investigation was done. With the Child Advocacy Center, it's all done simultaneously at the forensic interview. While the child is disclosing um, or discussing things, we actually have our statute book out. And as they're talking, we're looking at what crimes fit. The interview can give you information of how, who else to talk to, where there might be some other physical or other evidence in the case. Credibility is always at issue in trial, somebody's credibility. So when they can fill those in with details about was it light or dark out, what was the time of year, was it near your birthday, if, if they can begin to identify those things, particularly in cases like this, having a standard operating procedure is very good and we do the same thing all the time and you know we don't vary from it. Um, we get very good results, we get repeatable results. When a forensic interview starts an interview, they're just having a normal conversation, asking them about their day. Then when they start to get into specifics about why they're there, and when the child then has to start telling what happened to them, you see the affect change in these children. And that is priceless because you go from a child that's cheery, that's talking about everyday life to a traumatic event that happened to them and their affect change can show everything. You don't even need the words. We often don't have to go to trial because of these interviews. They're so well done, it's clear what happened. So you've got this person or this kid who presents so well in that interview and they're watching that and they're like, oh, I, I don't want any part of that. You know, maybe, maybe it will help us resolve this so the kid wouldn't have to testify at trial. The power of seeing the child talk about this is what happened to me, this is how it's impacted me. Uh, you really can't understate the power of that. And I think sometimes in the past what's been frustrating when you work with a family is that there's a lot of different people involved and everybody might have a really small piece of the puzzle and when you only hold a small piece of the puzzle you don't get to see the big picture. And being part of the MDT you might know what everybody is holding for their small piece and then when you can step back and see that it may look very different than when you're just looking at your individual component. I think as a detective we always want to have the answers for everything um, but we don't. It's impossible. I think the best thing to know is who to call when you do have those questions. And for me, contacting um, the various members of the CAC, MDT, is crucial. The communication that I've had with um, the prosecutors who handle my, my cases has improved tenfold. They're actively involved with the CAC interview process and um, they know the ins and outs of the case. I spend less time having to explain the case to a prosecutor. They actually have more involvement and know what's going on. And I'm just one part of it. Before, I was everything. I had to be the SART advocate, the investigator. You had to do it all. You know, I had to be the point person for when it was going to come to court, things like that. Now you have a bunch of people who are all invested in seeing the case come through and taking care of people. So it's not all just on us. One of the things that I've seen with my own staff is that there's a lot of cross-learning with different disciplines that we're working with. We may have a problem where our victim says to us, uh, I'm, I'm scared. I don't feel comfortable where I'm living I, um, and I, I want some help. Well, if I was only a part of a prosecution team, I have no tools to help a victim. But because I'm a part of a multidisciplinary team, I know who to reach out to. I know who has the shelters. Law enforcement is a, it's, its own community. And when you talk about mixing, mixing it up within other disciplines of child protective, uh, it's, sometimes it can be oil and water. The, the two sometimes don't mix very well. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised when I attended the forensic interview training that uh, we mix very well. And I've made some lasting contacts 
through my trainings with the CAC and, and as a forensic interviewer. We may have our own roles, we may have our own specific laws that we have to follow, our policies, our practices, but all in all, we're all looking at achieving one particular thing, and that's minimizing the trauma that children's and children and families experience through these difficult times, and working together so that there's a solid prosecution and address in addressing these issues. At certain intervals, multidisciplinary members come together for case review. I like the reviews, and we may be in a place where, like, look, we're stumped. You know, we want to go forward. Any other investigators or prosecutors or anybody else in the room, you know, have any ideas or suggestions? Uh, that can help us go forward. You know, the sharing of information, like DHH could be like, well, you know, that family was investigated, and did you know that this police department over here, you know, could have some information that might be helpful to you in your investigation. So I think reviews are good for letting all the partners know, you know, what everybody's doing and where things are moving or not moving, and also being able to get information and ideas from other people in the room. I think back to when I was first, when I first learned about the CAC, I was concerned that I was going to be questioned about how I conducted my investigation when it was the complete opposite. It was all about trying to help to make sure that the investigation is as good as it can possibly be, as opposed to a critique or a Monday morning quarterback type of thing. I was convinced that we were going to trial in this case. She immediately filed for a protection order and immediately stopped contact, so there was no need for DHS in that area to get involved for that. And between the grand jury I don't know if it was grand jury or what, and testifying, she realized that, that, that she realized what had happened was wrong. We want people to know that this resource exists. We don't want people to have to go through um, this at all. Uh, but if you have to, these are the people you need on your team because it takes a team uh, to get through something like this, for sure. The best thing I can tell you is to really walk through this process and leaving all of those reservations you have at the door uh, because the CAC is an amazing organization that's going to be able to provide and come alongside you. They're not going to look to take over your case. Their goal is not to investigate this. Their goal is to do the best that they can to come alongside you, interview this victim, and be able to provide the best resource for them and for you moving forward.